In Rome, the word on the streets was that Nero had ordered the fire so he could build his enormous palace. It was a rumor that would not go away. To regain the trust of his people, the emperor needed a scapegoat. He hit on the idea that anybody would believe anything of the Christians, uh, and also that there was a marvelous way of getting them to confess, because everybody knew that if you were a Christian, you wouldn't deny your Christianity. So if you announced that the Christians started the fire, anyone who confessed to their Christianity was assumed to have confessed to arson. It's clear that Nero treated the Christians with particular cruelty and barbarity. Tacitus tells us that he had them rounded up, he had them dressed in animal skins and attacked by dogs, he had some crucified, and he also had many burned. In the evening, he lined up his garden with Christians as human torches. Nero's attack on the Christians would be the first persecution of Christianity under the Roman Empire. It's believed both the disciple Peter and the apostle Paul were tortured and killed during Nero's reign. In the Bible's book of Revelations, John describes the end of the world and warns of a beast with two horns. Was it Nero that he had in mind? Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. In languages such as Greek and Hebrew, there was no separate set of numbers. Numbers were represented by the letters of the alphabet. When the name Nero Caesar is transliterated from the Greek, Nero and Kaiser, into the Hebrew, that is to say when the Greek characters of the name are replaced by Hebrew characters, then the numerical value of the name in Hebrew comes to 666. So as far as the church is concerned, there's no goodness in Nero. He is an antichrist figure. He is an embodiment of evil. In a bid to remove any potential rivals, Nero had systematically murdered every member of his family. When finally a major plot was hatched against him in 65 AD, it was masterminded by his friend, the senator Piso. The conspirators included senators, officers of the imperial guard, and even Nero's tutor and mentor, Seneca. The fatal blow was to be struck while Nero attended the Circus Maximus, Rome's vast chariot arena, during the Feast of Ceres. But the conspiracy was betrayed by a slave. One after the other, the conspirators were rounded up and put to death by Nero's execution squads. Piso was lucky. He was allowed to commit suicide by cutting his wrists. After his narrow escape, Nero began to see enemies everywhere. Each year, he murdered more and more senators, aristocrats and army officers. The final death toll would never be known. He comes to distrust those who are very competent. And on the other hand, he's afraid of them because he knows that they don't respect him. By the end of the reign, he's actually putting them to death. One of the reasons for the big rebellions, I think, is that all those people in charge of legions think that their days are numbered. 68 AD would be known as the year of the Great Rebellions. In March, Governor Vindex raised an army of 100,000 against the Emperor in Gaul. They were butchered by Nero's legions. But at the same time, a more serious rebellion was brewing in northern Spain, headed by the Governor Galba. In Rome, Galba's agents took control of Nero's palace guard. When they refused to take his orders, Nero knew his days as emperor were over. Nero was completely paralyzed. He was terrified that the armies had turned against him. He didn't trust anybody, and in the end, he decided to flee Rome and give it up. But it was this terror inspired by the awareness that he had made so many enemies. Nero fled some miles outside the city to the countryside villa of one of his ex-slaves. He made plans to adopt a new identity as a traveling musician. 
but Galba's agents had convinced the Senate to declare him a public enemy and issue orders for his arrest and execution. Realizing there was no escape, Nero snatched up two daggers which he had brought with him and tried the blade of each. At that moment, some horsemen drew near under orders to bring him back living. Aware of this, he hesitantly said, the thunder of swift-footed horses echoes round my ears. He then drove the dagger into his throat with the help of his secretary, Epaphroditus. Nero was dead, but for the Roman people, the nightmare would continue. In the year following his death, the empire would be ravaged by civil war. It would be called the Year of the Four Emperors. First, Galba, murdered after seven months in office. Then the Emperor Otho, driven to commit suicide three months later. Followed by Vitellius, whose short reign would end when he was tortured to death by the new Emperor Vespasian. Later emperors would try to eradicate the memory of Nero. They carved their own faces onto Nero's old statues and tore down his golden house, building baths over the ruins. But the legend of Nero would not die. For years after his death, there were wild rumors that Nero had somehow survived. The provinces were alive with sightings of men claiming to be the Roman emperor who played the lyre. An enormous arena was built obliterating the great lake that once reflected Nero's palace. The arena was called the Amphitheater of Titus. But everyone calls it the Colosseum because once a colossal statue of Nero stood there and no one could forget the sun god emperor Nero.